I'm glad for the reading today. I think we tend to shy away from that particular story of Jesus clearing the temple because, you know, he's angry. It's uncomfortable to think of Jesus being angry. I think it merely shows us Christ's humanity. It's, it had to be a daunting thing to march into that temple. And a little bit of anger is necessary to accomplish that. But underlying the anger we know was a deep love. Uh, last November, with uh, four friends of mine, none of them is here, Michael, two of them are coming this afternoon uh, to talk here, uh, we took part in uh, what we call the Shut It Down Climate Action, uh, in which we uh, broke into uh, five enclosures and shut down all five uh, pipelines bringing Canadian tar sands oil into the U.S. as an act of climate disobedience. For my part in that, cutting two chains and turning the safety block valve on the Trans Mountain Pipeline in Burlington, Washington, I faced several felony charges. My first trial in January ended in a hung jury, which was astounding <clears throat> because we offered a video of me actually doing something. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect it. <clears throat> I'm set to be retried in May. Um, since that action, I have appeared with my friends, Michael and the others, at many events to talk about the action. And we're often asked about the spiritual and religious uh, underpinnings for each of us in, in, uh, in, in coming to the action. Uh, and I didn't know my fellow valve trainers all that well before we took the action. And what time we had was spent in practical things like how big a bolt cutter should we get. We didn't spend a lot of time discussing the Bible. So it's been really enlightening for me to be at these forums and listen to my friends talk about why they did this, how they think about it. And I have, in all those times, come, come to conclude that there's sort of five different expressions of love that I hear from my friends and from myself. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. And those five expressions are a love for all living things, a love for our children, a love for all peoples, love for our enemies, and a love of life. Starting with the love of living things, there's a, an intimate link between biblical liter uh, literalism and climate denialism. Climate deniers point to Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, and God's promise that seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. To argue that climate cataclysm is impossible, unless God knows it. Senator James Inhofe, until recently chair of the Senate Environment Committee, has said that the point of Genesis uh, 822 is that God's still up there, and the arrogance of people who think that we human beings would be able to change what he is doing in the climate is to me outrageous. This may be one of the most egregious examples of, I think, of cherry picking biblical literature. But to pluck out those few lines of Genesis, one has to ignore perhaps the the most emphatic, repeated, direct statement from God in all of the scriptures. In the immediately preceding verses of Genesis chapter 5, God pronounces the rainbow covenant between God, post flood, between God, Noah and his family, representing all of humanity, and all living things on earth. It's a three part covenant. I'll read you those verses. And then God remembered Noah and every living thing, verse 1. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature, verse 9. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature, verse 12. I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature, verse 15. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and it will look on it, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature, verse 16. Do you truly believe that, that God thinks it's okay to wipe out the these are Creatures now in the severely endangered species of the low lying gorilla, the Sumatran tiger, the hawksbill turtle, the giant salamander, the storm petrel, the red jeweled beetle, or the cistine fur. Emily Johnson, one of my fellow valve turners, 
to shut off the two Enbridge pipelines in Leonard, uh, in Leonard, Minnesota, with Annette Clapstein, who's a climate activist in Seattle, and I'm hooked. And in her recent book of poetry, Her Animals, which starts, I am sorry, Emily, Emily grapples with this unspeakable agony, and I would like to read to you one of her short poems. Sentimentality may be part of the problem, but I cannot help my weakness for the greatest and the smallest. Massive elephants and vast whales, thumbnail-sized frogs, brilliant and paper-thin blue butterflies. For any viable cluster of those to survive until you read this, I give my life painfully every day for a year. Love of Children, Michael Foster, who was here, shut down the Trans Canada Pipeline in Pembina, Pembina, or Dakota. Among his many roles, Michael is a tireless advocate and a supporter for the Plaintiffs and Children's Atmospheric Trust lawsuit. By, uh, in the state of Washington, uh, which in December won a decision against Governor Inslee and the Department of Ecology for failing to take action on climate change. The essence of the lawsuit and others in a number of states and against the federal government and in several other nations is that our failure to act is a gargantuan and intergenerational theft, a theft of promise, of hope, and of life itself from our children. Michael speaks eloquently to our need to examine our own choices and behaviors with an eye to the practical and moral consequences for our children, their children, and so on. I recently had a forum in Carvalho's Michael quoted Chief Marvel of Looking Horse, that this is the moment in history when all life comes to depend on you and me. We are the only ones who can protect everything we love. Every experience you have ever had, every memory, every family tree on earth is threatened, it comes down to this moment in time. Annette Clapstein, who shut down the two Enbridge pipelines with Emily Johnson in Minnesota, is a member of the Seattle Region Grannies and has served for many years as a legal counsel to the Polo tribe. It is very clear, says Annette, that the harm done by climate change will be wildly disproportionate to the benefits that have been gained by burning fossil fuels, and the poor and the dispossessed, especially colonized peoples, will be those who experience the first and greatest injuries. Our action was in response to a call from, for direct action and prayer from the Standing Rock Sioux tribe fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline, about whom Annette says, we owe them a debt for their steadfast protection of land and water. The future of life depends on exactly such resolve and courage, but it is the obligation of the privileged to put even more on the line. If you're an older white person, this is your job. It is up to us to take these risks. I think a lot about love for our enemies and try to talk about it. It's a very tough thing. That Exxon, Shell, and a slew of corporations worked deliberately over decades to befuddle the civic conversation about the single greatest threat to the sanctity of life on the planet is, in the words of Bill McKibben, an unparalleled evil. What do you say to that kind of calculated and methodical destruction of the conditions that make civilization possible? How to grapple this uh, gargantuan and awfulness? Walter Wink, a theologian who challenged orthodoxy, said that Jesus Christ offers us an alternative to the two physiological responses to threat hardwired into our body, fight or flight. Faced with evil, violence, and oppression, we naturally prepare to respond with violence or submission. But Jesus, says Wink, showed us a third way of nonviolent disobedience and direct action. Uh, Wink wrote, Jesus is not telling us to submit to evil, but to refuse to oppose it on its own terms. We are not to let the opponent dictate the methods of our opposition. He is urging us to transcend both passivity and violence by finding a third way, one that is at once assertive and nonviolent. In so doing, we not only assert a powerful moral force, I believe, we also show love for our enemies. For as Martin Luther King said in his eloquent letter from Birmingham Jail, in a real sense, all life is interrelated, all men and women caught in an inexplicable network of mutuality, <clears throat> tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. 
I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you ne can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. To stand with dignity is an embarrassment to run for authority. But also, it is also an expression of faith in the humanity of the oppressor, and this is an expression of true love. And finally, Leonard Higgins, um, of no particular fixed address, who shut down the Spectre Express pipeline near Colbanks, Montana, and describes himself as the le least likely person to engage in such an action. Uh, says, if to continue as we are now is to embrace death, the death of 40 to 50 percent of known species by centuries now, the death of untold numbers primarily from drought and attendant starvation, and the death of hope, as the very conditions which make civilization possible are eroding. This prospect is so awful that it is often easier to turn one's eyes aside. But to do so is also to accept death. But to embrace truth and to act appropriately is to embrace life. Playwright and uh, president of, former president of the Czech Republic, Václav Havel, wrote, A person who has been seduced by the consumer value system, whose identity is dissolved in an amalgam of the accoutrements of mass civilization, and who has no roots in the order of being, no sense of responsibility for anything higher than his own personal survival, is a demoralized person. Living within the truth is, on the contrary, an attempt to regain control over one's own sense of responsibility. It is clearly a moral act, not only because one must pay so dearly for it, but principally because it is not self-serving. Lenin is a beacon of living in the truth. If you come, I think we're talking later on today, if you come to that or go to our website, shut it down about today, you can see a video short of, uh, about the action and listen to Leonard and he speaks of this sort of sheer joy of being given this opportunity to embrace life. So that's it. That's about uh, the, the types of love I find and hear in my friend's speech. Um, by our action, we, we, hoped, we hope to serve as a pivotal point which the course of history turns with those I had seen very, very long. Given the choice, however, none of us would act differently. This is our expression of love for all living things, for our children, for, our, for all peoples, for our enemies, and for life. I thank you for this opportunity to speak to you, and I'd like to end with, with the very appropriate words of Reinhold Mubarak's serenity prayer. God, Give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Amen. Amen. <laughs>